Hello friends, I'm Ellie, welcome to Cardboard Design. Today, I will tell you beautiful and meaningful fairy tales. It will bring you many lessons, let's listen. The first fairy tale, The Grave Mound. A rich farmer was one day standing in his yard inspecting his fields and gardens. The corn was growing up vigorously and the fruit trees were heavily laden with fruit. The grain of the year before still lay in such immense heaps on the floors that the rafters could hardly bear it. Then he went into the stable, where were well-fed oxen, fat cows, and horses bright as looking glass. At length he went back into his sitting room, and cast a glance at the iron chest in which his money lay. Whilst he was the standing surveying his riches, all at once there was a loud knock close by him. The knock was not at the door of his room, but at the door of his heart. It opened, and he heard a voice which said to him, Hast thou done good to thy family with it? Hast thou considered the necessities of the poor? Hast thou shared thy bread with the hungry? Hast thou been contented with what thou hast, or didst thou always desire to have more? The heart was not slow in answering. I have been hard and pitiless, and have never shown any kindness to my own family. If a beggar came, I turned away my eyes from him. I have not troubled myself about God, but have thought only of increasing my wealth. If everything which the sky covers had been mine own, I should still not have had enough. When he was aware of this answer, he was greatly alarmed. His knees began to tremble, and he was forced to sit down. Then there was another knock, but the knock was at the door of his room. It was his neighbor, a poor man who had a number of children whom he could no longer satisfy with food. I know, thought the poor man, that my neighbor is rich, but he is as hard as he is rich. I don't believe he will help me, but my children are crying for bread, so I will venture it. He said to the rich man, You do not readily give away anything that is yours, but I stand here like one who feels the water rising above his head. My children are starving, let me four measures of corn. The rich man looked at him long, and then the first sunbeam of mercy began to melt away a drop of the ice of greediness. I will not lend thee four measures, he answered, but I will make thee a present of eight, but thou must fulfill one condition. What am I to do? said the poor man. When I am dead, thou shalt watch for three nights by my grave. The peasant was disturbed in his mind at this request, but in the need in which he was, he would have consented to anything. He accepted, therefore, and carried the corn home with him. It seemed as if the rich man had foreseen what was about to happen, for when three days were gone by, he suddenly dropped down dead. No one knew exactly how it came to pass, but no one grieved for him. When he was buried, the poor man remembered his promise. He would willingly have been released from it, but he thought, after all, he acted kindly by me. I have fed my hungry children with his corn, and even if that were not the case, where I have once given my promise, I must keep it. At nightfall, he went into the churchyard and seated himself on the grave mound. Everything was quiet. Only the moon appeared above the grave, and frequently an owl flew past and uttered her melancholy cry. When the sun rose, the poor man betook himself in safety to his home, and in the same manner the second night passed quietly by. On the evening of the third day, he felt a strange uneasiness. It seemed to him that something was about to happen. When he went out he saw by the churchyard wall, a man whom he had never seen before. He was no longer young, had scars on his face, and his eyes looked sharply and eagerly around. He was entirely covered with an old cloak, and nothing was visible but his great riding boots. What are you looking for here? The peasant asked. Are you not afraid of the lonely churchyard? I am looking for nothing. He answered. And I am afraid of nothing. I am like the youngster who went forth to learn how to shiver and had his labor for his pains, but got the king's daughter to wife and great wealth with her. Only I have remained poor. I am nothing but a paid-off soldier, and I mean to pass the night here, because I have no other shelter. If you are without fear, said the peasant, stay with me, and help me to watch that grave there. To keep watch is a soldier's business, he replied. Whatever we fall in with here, whether it be good or bad, we will share it between us. The peasant agreed to this 
and they seated themselves on the grave together. All was quiet until midnight, when suddenly a shrill whistling was heard in the air, and the two watchers perceived the evil one standing bodily before them. Be up, you rattle muffins! cried he to them. The man who lies in that grave belongs to me. I want to take him, and if you don't go away, I will wring your necks! Sir with the red feather! said the soldier. You are not my captain. I have no need to obey you, and I have not yet learned how to fear. Go away. We shall stay sitting here. The devil thought to himself. Money is the best thing with which to get hold of these two vagabonds. So he began to play a softer tune, and asked quite kindly if they would not accept a bag of money and go home with it. That is worth listening to, answered the soldier. But one bag of gold won't serve us. If you will give as much as will go into one of my boots, we will quit the field for you and go away, eh? I have not so much as that about me, said the devil. But I will fetch it. In the neighboring town lives a money changer who is a good friend of mine and will readily advance it to me. When the devil had banished the soldier took his left boot off and said, we will soon pull the charcoal burner's nose for him. Just give me your knife, comrade. He cut the sole off the boot and put it in the high grass near the grave on the edge of a hole that was half overgrown. That will do, said he. Now the chimney sweep may come. They both sat down and waited, and it was not long before the devil returned with a small bag of gold in his hand. Just pour it in, said the soldier, raising up the boot a little. But that won't be enough. The black one shook out all that was in the bag, the gold fell through, and the boot remained empty. Stupid devil! cried the soldier. It won't do! Didn't I say so at once? Go back again, and bring more! The devil shook his head, went, and in an hour's time came with a much larger bag under his arm. Now pour it in! cried the soldier. But I doubt the boot won't be full. The gold clinked as it fell, but the boot remained empty. The devil looked in himself with his burning eyes and convinced himself of the truth. You have shamefully big calves to your leg, cried he and made a wry face. Did you think, replied the soldier, that I had a cloven foot like you? Since when have you been so stingy? See that you get more gold together or our bargain will come to nothing. The wicked one went off again. This time he stayed away longer, and when at length he appeared he was panting under the weight of a sack which lay on his shoulders. He emptied it into the boot, which was just as far from being filled as before. He became furious, and was just going to tear the boot out of the soldier's hands, but at that moment the first ray of the rising sun broke forth from the sky, and the evil spirit fled away with loud shrieks. The poor soul was saved. The peasant wished to divide the gold, but the soldier said, Give what falls to my lot to the poor. I will come with thee to thy cottage, and together we will live in rest and peace on what remains, as long as God is pleased to permit. The wealthy farmer is portrayed as greedy, solely focused on increasing personal wealth without considering the needs of others. This greed ultimately leads to an encounter with the devil, highlighting that greed can have negative consequences. The poor farmer keeps his promise, even after the death of the wealthy man. The significance lies in the values of honesty and keeping one's word, even when it requires personal sacrifice. The devil represents malevolence and greed. In the story, the devil attempts to tempt the farmer and the soldier with their desires. However, through cleverness and wisdom, they outsmart the devil demonstrating that intelligence and virtue can overcome temptation. The soldier not only helps the poor farmer but suggests sharing their newfound wealth with the less fortunate. The story underscores the importance of sacrifice and compassion, promoting a sense of communal well-being. In summary, the story encompasses profound meanings related to karma, compassion, honesty, sacrifice, and the triumph of virtue over vice. It is often seen as a lesson on the value of positive actions and compassion in life. The Second Fairy Tale Made Malian. There was once a king who had a son who asked in marriage the daughter of a mighty king. 
She was called Maid Malian and was very beautiful. As her father wished to give her to another, the prince was rejected, but as they both loved each other with all their heart, they would not give each other up, and Maid Malin said to her father, I can and will take no other for my husband. Then the king flew into a passion, and ordered a dark tower to be built, into which no ray of sunlight or moonlight should enter. When it was finished, he said, Therein shalt thou be imprisoned for seven years, and then I will come and see if thy perverse spirit is broken. Meat and drink for the seven years were carried into the tower, and then she and her waiting woman were led into it and walled up, and thus cut off from the sky and from the earth. There they sat in the darkness, and knew not when day or night began. The king's son often went round and round the tower, and called their names, but no sound from without pierced through the thick walls. What else could they do but lament and complain? Meanwhile the time passed, and by the diminution of the food and drink they knew that the seven years were coming to an end. They thought the moment of their deliverance was come, but no stroke of the hammer was hurt, no stone fell out of the wall, and it seemed to Maid Malian that her father had forgotten her. As they only had food for a short time longer, and saw a miserable death awaiting them, Maid Malin said, We must try our last chance and see if we can break through the wall. She took the bread knife and picked and bored at the mortar of a stone, and when she was tired, the waiting maid took her turn. With great labor they succeeded in getting out one stone, and then a second, and a third, and when three days were over the first ray of light fell on their darkness, and at last the opening was so large that they could look out. The sky was blue, and a fresh breeze played on their faces, but how melancholy everything looked all around. Her father's castle lay in ruins. The town and the villages were so far as could be seen, destroyed by fire, the fields far and wide laid to waste, and no human being was visible. When the opening in the wall was large enough for them to slip through, the waiting maid sprang down first, and then Maid Malin followed. But where were they to go? The enemy had ravaged the whole kingdom, driven away the king, and slain all the inhabitants. They wandered forth to seek another country, but nowhere did they find a shelter, or a human being to give them a mouthful of bread, and their need was so great that they were forced to appease their hunger with nettles. When, after long journey, they came into another country, they tried to get work everywhere, but wherever they knocked they were turned away, and no one would have pity on them. At last they arrived in a large city and went to the royal palace. There also they were ordered to go away, but at last the cook said that they might stay in the kitchen and be scullion. The son of the king in whose kingdom they were, was, however, the very man who had been betrothed to Maid Malin. His father had chosen another bride for him, whose face was as ugly as her heart was wicked. The wedding was fixed, and the maiden had already arrived, but because of her great ugliness, However, she shut herself in her room, and allowed no one to see her, and Maid Malin had to take her her meals from the kitchen. When the day came for the bride and the bridegroom to go to church, she was ashamed of her ugliness, and afraid that if she showed herself in the streets, she would be mocked and laughed at by the people. Then said she to Maid Malian, A great piece of luck has befallen thee. I have sprained my foot, and cannot well walk through the streets. Thou shalt put on my wedding clothes and take my place, a greater honor than that thou canst not have. Maid Malian, however, refused it and said, I wish for no honor which is not suitable for me. It was in vain, too, that the bride offered her gold. At last she said angrily, If thou dost not obey me, it shall cost thee thy life. I have but to speak the word and thy head will lie at thy feet. Then she was forced to obey, and put on the bride's magnificent clothes and all her jewels. When she entered the royal hall, everyone was amazed at her great beauty, and the king said to his son, This is the bride whom I have chosen for thee, and whom thou must lead to church. The bridegroom was astonished, and thought, She is like my maid Moline, and I should believe that it was she herself but she has long been shut up in the tower, or dead. He took her by the hand and led her to church. On the way was a nettle plant, and she said, Oh, nettle plant! Little nettle plant! What dost thou here alone? I have known the time! 
When I ate the unboiled? When I ate the unroasted? What art thou saying? Asked the king's son. Nothing? She replied. I was only thinking of Maid Moline. He was surprised that she knew about her but kept silence. When they came to the foot plank into the churchyard, she said, Foot bridge, do not break. I am not the true bride. What art thou saying there? Asked the king's son. Nothing? She replied. I was only thinking of Maid Moline. Dost thou know Maid Moline? No. She answered. How should I know her? I have only heard of her. When they came to the church door, she said once more, Church door, break not. I am not the I true bride. What art thou saying there? Asked he. Ah, she answered. I was only thinking of Maid Moline. Then he took out a precious chain, put it round her neck, and fastened the clasp. Thereupon they entered the church, and the priest joined their hands together before the altar and married them. He led her home, but she did not speak a single word the whole way. When they got back to the royal palace, she hurried into the bride's chamber, put off the magnificent clothes and the jewels, dressed herself in her grey gown, and kept nothing but the jewel on her neck, which she had received from the bridegroom. When the night came, and the bride was to be led into the prince's apartment, she let her veil fall over her face, that he might not observe the deception. As soon as everyone had gone away, he said to her, What didst thou say to the nettle plant which was growing by the wayside? To which nettle plant? Asked she. I don't talk to nettle plants. If thou didst not do it, then thou art not the true bride. Said he. So she bethought herself and said, I must go out unto my maid, who keeps my thoughts for me. She went out and sought Maid Malian. Go, what hast thou been saying to the nettle? I said nothing but. Oh, now plant, little nettle plant. What dost thou here alone? I have known the time. When I ate the unboiled? When I ate the unroasted? The bride ran back into the chamber and said, I know now what I said to the nettle. And she repeated the words which she had just heard. But what didst thou say to the footbridge when we went over it? Asked the king's son. To the footbridge? She answered, I don't talk to footbridges. Then thou art not the true bride. She again said, I must go out unto my maid, who keeps my thoughts for me, and ran out and found Maid Maline. Go, oh, what didst thou say to the footbridge? I said nothing but, Footbridge, do not break. I am not the true bride. That costs thee thy life, cried the bride, but she hurried into the room and said, I know now what I said to the footbridge. And she repeated the words. But what didst thou say to the church door? To the church door? She replied. I don't talk to church doors. Then thou art not the true bride. She went out and found Maid Maline and said. Girl, what didst thou say to the church door? I said nothing but. Church door, break not. I am not the true bride. That will break thy neck for thee, cried the bride, and flew into a terrible passion. But she hastened back into the room and said, I know now what I said to the church door. And she repeated the words, But where hast thou the jewel which I gave thee at the church door? What jewel? She answered, Thou didst not give me any jewel. I myself put it round thy neck, and I myself fastened it. If thou dost not know that, thou art not the true bride. He drew the veil from her face, and when he saw her immeasurable ugliness, he sprang back terrified, and said, How comest thou here? Who art thou? I am thy betrothed bride, but because I feared lest the people should mock me when they saw me out of doors, I commanded the scullery maid to dress herself in my clothes, and to go to church instead of me. Where is the girl? Said he. I want to see her. Go and bring her here. She went out and told the servants that the scullery maid was an imposter, and that they must take her out into the courtyard and strike off her head. The servants laid hold of Maid Maline and wanted to drag her out, but she screamed so loudly for help that the king's son heard her voice, hurried out of his chamber and ordered them to set the maiden free instantly. Lights were brought, 
and then he saw on her neck the gold chain which he had given her at the church door. Thou art the true bride, said he, who went with me to the church, come with me now to my room. When they were both alone, he said, On the way to church thou didst name Maid Moline, who was my betrothed bride, if I could believe it possible, I should think she was standing before me thou art like her in every respect. She answered, I am Maid Moline, who for thy sake was imprisoned seven years in the darkness, who suffered hunger and thirst, and has lived so long in want and poverty? Today, however, the sun is shining on me once more. I was married to thee in the church, and I am thy lawful wife. Then they kissed each other, and were happy all the days of their lives. The false bride was rewarded for what she had done by having her head cut off. The tower in which Maid Malian had been imprisoned remained standing for a long time, and when the children passed by it they sang, Clang, clang, Gloria! Who sits within this tower? A king's daughter, she sits within. A sight of her I cannot win. The wall it will not break. The stone cannot be pierced. Little Hans, with your coat so gay. Follow me, follow me fast as you may. Maid Maline and the king's son exemplify unwavering loyalty and true love. Despite the challenges and separation, their commitment to each other remains steadfast. Maid Maline's resilience and determination in the face of adversity are commendable. She endures imprisonment, hunger, and poverty for seven years, but remains steadfast in her pursuit of freedom and reunion with her beloved. The false bride's deceit leads to severe consequences. Her attempt to replace Maid Maline results in her exposure, and she ultimately pays the price for her dishonesty with the loss of her life. The king's son recognizes Maid Moline's true identity through her words and actions, emphasizing the importance of looking beyond outward appearances and valuing inner qualities. Maid Moline's authenticity prevails over deception. The genuine bond between the king's son and Maid Moline cannot be replicated or replaced, highlighting the power of true identity and genuine connection. In summary, Maid Moline is a tale of love, loyalty, courage, justice, and the triumph of authenticity over deception. It teaches the importance of staying true to oneself, enduring challenges with courage, and recognizing genuine connections. The third fairy tale, the old man made young again. In the time when our Lord still walked this earth, he and street. Peter stopped one evening at a smith's and received free quarters. Then it came to pass that a poor beggar, hardly pressed by age and infirmity, came to this house and begged alms of the smith. Street! Peter had compassion on him and said, Lord and Master, if it please thee, cure his torments that he may be able to win his own bread. The Lord said kindly, Smith, lend me thy forge, and put on some coals for me, and then I will make this ailing old man young again. The smith was quite willing, and street. Peter blew the bellows, and when the coal fire sparkled up large and higher, Lord took the little old man, pushed him in the forge in the midst of the red hot fire, so that he glowed like a rose bush, and praised God with a loud voice. After that, the Lord went to the quenching tub, put the glowing little man into it so that the water closed over him, and after he had carefully cooled him, gave him his blessing. When behold, the little man sprang nimbly out, looking fresh, straight, healthy, and as if he were but twenty. The smith, who had watched everything closely and attentively, invited them all to supper. He, however, had an old half-blind crooked mother-in-law who went to the youth and with great earnestness asked if the fire had burned him much. He answered that he had never felt more comfortable, and that he had sat in the red heat as if he had been in cool dew. The youth's words echoed in the ears of the old woman all night long, and early next morning, when the Lord had gone on his way again and had heartily thanked the smith, the latter thought he might make his old mother-in-law young again likewise, as he had watched everything so carefully. And it lay in the province of his trade. So he called to ask her if she, too, would like to go bounding about like a girl of 18. She said, With all my heart, as the youth has come out of it so well! So the smith made a great fire, and thrust the old woman into it, and she writhed about this way and that, and uttered terrible cries of murder. 
sit still why are thou screaming and jumping about so 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 cried he and as he spoke he blew the bellows again until all her rags were burnt the old woman cried without ceasing and the smith thought to himself i have not quite the right art and took her out and threw her into the cooling tub then she screamed so loudly that the smith's wife upstairs and her daughter-in-law heard and they both ran downstairs and saw the old woman lying in a heap in the quenching tub howling and screaming with her face wrinkled and shriveled and all out of shape thereupon the two who were both with child were so terrified that that very night two boys were born who were not made like men but apes and they ran into the woods and from them sprang the race of apes the story cautions against meddling with natural laws and altering age in an unusual way. Sometimes, thoughtless intervention can lead to unforeseen consequences. The blacksmith initially witnessed the Lord and Street. Peter performing a miracle that they believed would bring benefits. However, when the blacksmith attempted a similar action himself, it resulted in unintended consequences. The blacksmith's envy led him to try to go against natural laws. This could symbolize the dangers of envy and uncontrolled greed. Thoughtless intervention led to unforeseen consequences creating two children with appearances resembling apes. This emphasizes the unpredictability of intervening in the natural order. The risk of jealousy. The blacksmith's jealousy led to attempting to defy natural laws. This may highlight the risk of jealousy and uncontrolled greed. In summary, the story underscores the importance of respecting the natural order and refraining from thoughtless interference with its laws. It emphasizes the need for consciousness, responsibility, and awareness when considering actions that may alter the course of nature. The fourth fairy tale, The Stolen Farthings. A father was one day sitting at dinner with his wife and his children, and a good friend who had come on a visit was with them. And as they the sat, and it was striking 12 o'clock, the stranger saw the door open, and a very pale child dressed in snow-white clothes came in. It did not look around, and it did not speak, but went straight into the next room. Soon afterwards it came back, and went out at the door again in the same quiet manner. On the second and on the third day, it came also exactly in the same way. At last the stranger asked the father to whom the beautiful child that went into the next room every day at noon belonged. I have never seen it, said he, neither did he know to whom it could belong. The next day when it again came, the stranger pointed it out to the father, who however did not see it, and the mother and the children also all saw nothing. On this the stranger got up, went to the room door, opened it a little, and peeped in. Then he saw the child sitting on the ground, and digging and seeking about industriously amongst the crevices between the boards of the floor, but when it saw the stranger, it disappeared. He now told what he had seen and described the child exactly, and the mother recognized it, and said, Ah, oh, it is my dear child who died a month ago. They took up the boards and found two farthings which the child had once received from its mother that it might give them to a poor man. It, however, had thought. Thou canst buy thyself a biscuit for that. And had kept the farthings, and hidden them in the openings between the boards, and therefore it had had no rest in its grave, and had come every day at noon to seek for these farthings. The parents gave the money at once to a poor man, and after that the child was never seen again. The narrative suggests that the child's spirit was unable to find peace due to the unfulfilled task of giving the farthings to a poor man. This concept reflects the idea of unsettled matters keeping spirits from finding rest in the afterlife. The child's decision to keep the farthings instead of giving them to the poor may symbolize feelings of guilt or unfinished generosity. The act of finally giving the money to a poor man may represent a form of redemption for the spirit. Once the farthings were given to a poor man, the child's spirit was no longer seen. This suggests that by addressing the unfinished business and rectifying the situation, harmony was restored and the spirit found peace. The story ends here. Have you learned any lessons from the fairy tales I told? I will be back soon to tell you other fascinating fairy tales. Bye-bye!